there is some downside to that for sure. Um, uh, so I've kind of tried to strike a balance. And so with this, with buying these 160 new birds, I'm hoping to kind of balance out some of that. And I'm, I'm actually kind of getting rid of some of my smaller suppliers. So I'm just focusing on a couple of the bigger ones. Um, it'll make life a little easier and more streamlined. Um, but for replacement, what I'm planning to do is when these birds arrived, I did ban them all so I could keep track of them and know which is which. Um, I'm expecting them to peak in their lane schedule by next fall. So they will be, I guess they'll be about 18 to 20 months. Um, well, 20 months old, probably uh, next fall. Yeah, so they'll be almost two years old. So they will be peaking at that point. So my plan right now is to bring in another 100 birds um, next summer. Um, to kind of incorporate them into to this, this flock. Um, and at that point, um, so, so generally I'm gonna try like an 18 to 20 month of replacement kind of, uh, that's my plan right now to, to look at. And there's a couple options. You could just keep getting the same production red birds that look the same, and then you could just band them with different leg bands color wise to so keep track of which flock is which. Um, I'm probably gonna try a different breed altogether for this second batch. Um, um, like I said, a heritage breed, I'm kind of leaning toward the Plymouth Rock right now, the barred Plymouth Rock, um, but we'll, we'll see what I, what I land on. Also, when you're trying to buy 100 to 200 birds at a time, I, I, I'm also going the route of buying um, ready to lay pullets. And that means that they are five months old already. Someone else has raised them, so you didn't have to put the investment into that. Um, and they come to you already laying. Now, you pay a lot more money for that age bird than you would a baby chick. But um, you know, you hit the ground running. You don't. You don't. You're not spending uh, that five months of of energy and cost raising them, um, and also there's loss associated with that, obviously. Um, so finding. So if you lived anywhere else in the country, if you lived on one of the coasts or some of the, I know in Michigan and Wisconsin, some other states, it's easy to find 200 ready to lay pullets. There are operations that just raise those that type of bird and sell them to people like me. Um, you know, in, in the hundreds. Um, so around here, it's harder to find that. I, I tried um, two years ago uh, buying 50 Rhode Island Reds from a farmer in Iowa who raised them for me. And I bought them at five months of age and I, I had no control over the way he was raising them and it, it didn't work out so well. <laughs> um, they had been kept uh, too tightly confined for five months. Um, also, I wasn't um, in control of where he got the birds from originally. So their breeding was a little suspect. Um, so I had a lot of problems with that batch. Um, this batch that I have now, the 160, they actually came from a farmer in Michigan who raises ready to lay pullets. Uh, well, uh, good reputation, um, you know, healthy, um, happy, active birds. So I kind of knew uh, where they were coming from. And, and a friend of mine had bought them and had them on his place for a while and then sold them to me. So they were kind of secondhand to me. Um, so next year, when I go to buy my next flock, I'm going to be searching uh, for a ready to lay pullet uh, producer, um, and it's going to be out of state, I'm sure, and I'm going to have to travel um, and, and get them. So that's going to be quite a, a, an adventure, I'm sure. But that's kind of my, my plan um, at this point. Um, all right, we can go back here and just kind of cruise through here. If you do decide to raise chicks from babies, from day olds, they do require a lot more um, effort and work. You know, they do need special care. They need, um, you know, a special brooder that is, uh, that is hot. They like to be kept at around 95 um, to 98 degrees. Um, you need a heat lamp. Um, you need special chick starter food. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's a lot more work. It, it's very rewarding if you're doing this in a backyard setting with your family, with your children. Um, kids love to do this. Um, we, that's how we started out. Uh, when my kids were little, we lived in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, we, we got backyard chickens there. We had four um, with a little, you know, cute dollhouse coop. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my crazy chicken lady adventures. Um, and I fell in love with them and they were the best pets. So we... You know, these are my kids when they were little. It was a lot of fun to play with them um, and, you know, get to know the, the birds. And they were so tame, um, <laughs> giving roosting lessons here for the, the buff Orpingtons. Um, but generally, uh, you, can, you can go e either way. But if you do the chicken, baby chicken, baby chick uh, route, um, there's a lot of different ways you can raise them. This is a homemade brooder that, we've, that we made. We've used all kinds of things from 
um, dog kennels to Rubbermaid totes. I think this is a dog kennel um, that I put some chicken, some hardware cloth around the bottom, um, you know, used a heat lamp. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, I would encourage you all to be really careful when you select heat lamps. Right now they make the heat lamps that are much safer um, for use. Uh, we actually had a barn fire or a garage fire with one of our heat lamps, which was pretty damaging. So uh, I try to steer away from those red heat lamps now. You can buy the shelf lamps, um, which uh, basically look like a little shelf and they're, they really won't start any fires and the chickens can go underneath the chicks can go underneath the shelf and heat themselves up just like they would under a, a mama hen. Um, let's see here. So that's kind of, a, uh, you'll need special chick starter food. Now, also, if you go just buy your food commercially um, at the feed store, we'll talk a little bit about feed. We're kind of jumping ahead, but while we're on that topic. So for chick starter feed, you're gonna have two options. You're gonna have medicated and non-medicated. Um, that's a personal preference. Um, there's kind of controversy over, over them sometimes, but um, generally the, the, the medicine that's in the feed will help prevent coccidiosis, which is a parasitic um, uh, disease that, that can attack baby chicks, poultry, other animals as well. But um, if, if you do get coccidiosis in your flock, it can wipe out a lot of them pretty quickly. It's an intestinal parasite. Um, so if you do want to choose the, the uh, chick starter that's got the medicine in it, it supposedly will prevent some of that. Um, I haven't noticed one way or another that one's better than the other in my own experience. Um, in the last two years, I have switched completely off commercial feed. Um, I don't know about you guys, and if, you, if you've opened up one of those 50 pound bags of feed, whether it's chick starter or layer feed, that chemical smell that hits you in the face, um, I don't appreciate. I don't want to feed that to my animals. Um, I also don't want to contribute to um, what is what is a small portion of, of a, a broken food system and, and agriculture system. So <laughs> um, I actually buy all my feed from Kay Creek Ranch in Canby, Minnesota. Lyle Cruzy, um, it's a great family uh, run farm, grass fed operation, diversified, regenerative. Um, Lyle really knows what he's doing up there and he makes a great layer feed and a great chick starter. He grows all the feed himself. It's organic, it's non-GMO. He mills it, he has his own recipe. Um, I buy that feed in 1000 pound totes um, from him and um, get it. I, you, the downside is if you buy from Lyle, you have to go up there and pick it up in Canby. So you can, he will sell it to you by the pounds. So you can bring your own containers and buy as many pounds as you want, or you can buy the 1000 pound tote if you have a truck or a way to haul it. Um, I usually buy 4,000 pounds at a time. I tr truck it down here. Um, and then I sell that as kind of one of my side gigs. Um, I sell that feed by the pound to backyard chicken owners in Sioux Falls. Um, so this is another like aspect I want to just mention about running any of these farming businesses that we all run is what's called vertical stacking, where you where you can find all these little enterprises and stack them on top of each other to make your business a little, well, it helps in many ways, right? It can make you, um, it can help with networking. It can give you uh, social capital out in the world. It can give you brand recognition. Um, it can give you more profit, more profitability. Um, all kinds of ways to, to increase your presence in the local food system. Um, so, so for example, I teach backyard chicken keeping classes for Sioux Falls Community Ed. Um, I also go around and teach classes for new uh, communities who have just adopted chicken ordinances in their city council, in their, uh, for their, for their uh, towns. Um, I, you know, I sell the, I keep in touch and, and keep a close um, contact with a lot of the chicken owners around the area so I can sell them my feed. So, uh, you know, just kind of trying to like be creative and put yourself out there in ways that maybe you hadn't thought of originally as part of your, your farming business. Um, um, so anyway, so I buy my chick starter from, from K Creek Ranch. I buy my, um, my, uh, my layer feed from him. Um, it's, a, it's a great, he also has a soy free layer feed if you're interested in that. Um, and it's basically what I, what I so enjoy about his feed is you can open up um, one of his totes and the, there's just beautiful smells and aromas of grain. And I really feel, and I, I'm sure I should probably do this sometime, you could pour some of that in a bowl, add some maple syrup, some warm milk, and you could eat it yourself. So um, it's a little different than that commercial feed from the, from the tractor, uh, tractor supply and, and all those kind of places. 
Um, okay, so I, I kind of got a little off here on feed. Um, so we, we kind of hit, if there's any other questions about raising baby chicks, you can uh, drop it in the chat or let me know. Um, let's see, one of your biggest investments with, um, let me see if I can get this to work. Hold on guys. Um, for, for your chickens is gonna be your housing, right? Like your coop, what that's gonna look like. Let me just forward through to this real quick. Um, there's lots of options with chicken coops. So um, what I have here generally is a variety of stationary coops with runs attached. Um, and generally what those you know can look like, here's an example of our first chicken coop here that we bought. You know, it's four foot by eight foot. It came in a kit. We ordered it online. We just had to assemble it, put shingles on it, and away you go. We built a run to attach to it. Um, and we screened that run in with hardware cloth. I would strongly encourage everyone to not use chicken wire. It does not keep predators out. We use galvanized um, steel hardware cloth. I think we use the one half inch um, square openings. It comes in rolls. Um, you can roll it out on, on any uh, framing and staple gun it in or however you wanna secure it. Um, but it's really good for predators. Anytime I buy a chicken coop that's already assembled or is a kit um, such as this one, I will then take hardware cloth and put it over, um, over the window, like a sheet of it here, because uh, I have had my own dog break through these windows to get into the chicken coop. So um, you never know what's going to happen um, or, or, you know, how, how serious the, the predator wants to be to get in there. Um, so we have, so right now we have, we've had a lot of chicken coops and we kind of still have them spread out all over the place. We did just invest in a brand new um, building um, that was built uh, by quality storage buildings out in T South Dakota. And it's a 12 foot by 24 chicken coop. I unfortunately don't have a picture of it to show you right now, um, but it uh, it's huge. And we got it in advance of these new 160 birds that we got um, a few months ago. So it's a great building. We, uh, we have put an exhaust fan in it. So it really keeps well ventilated. Um, you know, we, we built roosts, we put some nest box in there, nesting boxes. Um, so we're, we're sticking with kind of the permanent um, coop situation. It works better for us. I live on an incredibly hilly um, uh, acreage. Um, we are at like the top of a hill and we've got hills all over. It, it's um, in some creeks running through here. So we can't really do a lot of moving a, a chicken tractor around, um, which is the other type of chicken uh, coop, which is a portable um, way to, to have your chickens. Um, I know some of you who might be thinking of like uh, getting into the egg business and doing something bigger. Um, there's some great like chips, gypsy wagon style or caravan um, chicken coops that are on flatbeds that you can haul around your acreage um, with a ATV or a tractor um, and then set up, you know, rotational grazing, uh, netting, um, electric netting for your chickens and move them around that way, which is kind of a, a typical way it's done. Um, we, we just let ours out, our, our birds out. We just let them free range wherever they want to go. Uh, we don't have them contained with netting. Um, but, you know, there's pros and cons to both of that, obviously. Uh, predator proofing, I mentioned it's super important. You're putting a huge investment into these birds. So, um, you know, it's really devastating when you, when you come out and, you, you know, you've lost 10 to 15 of them to a predator overnight or, or something like that. So I would encourage you to do as much up front that you can to, pr uh, to predator proof. Um, so you don't have that heartbreak later on. Um, we're doing the deep litter method for our chicken coop, our new one. Um, I've had trouble making this successful in the past. And so I'm hoping that I can get it right this time. But basically, it's an 8 to 12 inch base of, of bedding. And I'm using pine shavings. People use other things from pine needles to you know I'm, straw. I think there's lots of other things people have tried to use for this purpose. But I'm using um, pine shavings and diatomaceous earth. Um, and diatomaceous earth is basically a, um, it's a product that it's a drying agent and it's, it's natural. It's a natural product. I buy the food grade version of it. Um, but it's, and I know, I think I saw Rick Grosick on here. I know he's like a science guy, but, um, I'm not, I'm going to, um, 
mess up the description of what diatomaceous earth is. But from what I understand, it's uh, from diatoms, which are on the floor of the ocean. And, and that gets all crushed up. So that so it's basically full of silica, naturally occurring silica. So it's a white powder and I uh, keep a big bin of it. You have to wear a mask when you work with it because it's, it's not good for your respiratory tract to breathe it in. So I wear gloves and a mask. Um, I use an old flour sifter, which works great to scoop out some and then you just sift it all over the top of your bedding and kind of stir it in. And I do that regularly. Like I would say once a week, I'm going in there sometimes twice a week. I'm stirring all the bedding. You want to keep it moving and keep air flowing and keep it stirring because the idea is that you're just basically all the waste from the chickens, um, all the um, it's just going to compost itself into this dry pine shavings, diatomaceous earth mix. Um, so you shouldn't need to clean out your chicken coop more than once or twice a year if you can get the deep litter method to work well. It just self composts. Um, so I'm, I'm learning, like, for example, since I've only been doing this for about six weeks, that once a week stirrings is not enough for the number of birds I have because their droppings are pretty wet. They're falling on top of everything and I, I'm having to stir it more frequently. Um, so, so it is a little more effort um, on a regular basis. Um, so that's kind of the story on bedding and cleaning out your, your coop. Um, nesting boxes, I can't say enough good things about the new boxes that we just bought, which are best nest boxes. You can just, excuse me, just Google them. They have a website. They're not inexpensive, but they are so sweet. <laughs> um, stainless steel, they're the roll away nest boxes. They can be mounted on any wall of your coop. Um, they have uh, a communal uh, nest box area for laying, which is super cool. Um, I've always in the past only had the individual nest boxes and the birds, um, and I've read this, but I've seen it uh, for real, they're, they're happier in a communal setting of laying. Um, so it's just one big open area inside there and there's curtains so they can get in there. It's the floor of the, the nest box is a kind of a, a fake plastic um, rubbery turf of sorts so that I can take it out and hose it down. Um, very easy to clean. And then it's at a slight angle. So the, the eggs will roll away into the front um, section of the, of, the, of the box where the hens can't get to them. They can't poop on them. They can't peck them. They can't try to eat them if you have an egg eater. Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really a nice setup and I'm enjoying them and, and enjoying having clean eggs, which is really part of it, a big part of it. Um, so one of the main things I will touch on for anyone who's new to chickens or is, is having trouble with them maybe in the winter or is ventilation. It's the most important thing in your coop for your bird's health. Um, and uh, oftentimes people try to make coops as um, just completely closed off as possible. They wanna insulate them, they wanna heat them. Well, I would say none of that is necessary. You do want some airflow in there. Um, a chicken, their temperature, their regular uh, resting body temperature, I think is around 106 degrees. So they're hot. And when you get a lot of them in a small uh, enclosed space, they create a lot of moist heat. And when they're in there sleeping at night, they're, they actually on their roost will continue to poop all night long while they sleep. So that, uh, that wet, uh, moist, humid, hot air fills the, the building and you need an escape for it. So it's super important to have ridge vents on your roof. Um, we also add, um, we often add more venting in our coops because we find that the ridge vents aren't quite enough. So for example, um, I'll just point it out on here, up here in this, in this section of the coop, we usually cut out a rectangular um, cutout and cover it with just like a, a heating vent. And we do that on both ends so that the, the air, the hot air can rise, go out the ridge vent, and then also go out um, on those two ends. So we, that's been really helpful. Um, you'll know you have too much moist, hot air in your coop um, if and you'll especially notice it in the winter because you'll start seeing frostbite on your chickens' combs and potentially even their feet. Um, so it's so if you start seeing that, you might want to think about how you can add more airflow. You don't want um, openings that are at the level of the roost because you don't want drafts on the birds while they're sleeping. But any openings you can create up high are going to help them a lot. Um, so winter, we don't do anything different with our birds in the winter. Um, make sure you have good ventilation. Um, 
We do, uh, sometimes if we get any of those 25 below zero uh, type winters, we will line the walls of the coop with straw um, just to give some added insulation. We've done also where we've stacked straw bales on the outside of the coop walls um, when we had some coops that weren't um, super sturdy uh, or super warm. Um, but generally we don't add any heat. Um, you know, chickens can keep themselves uh, just fine in the winter here in South Dakota. And they, as long as we have a gradual, you know, decrease in temperature as we head into winter, they'll adjust to it. Um, it's more dangerous to have them used to a heated coop and then have, you know, have them go out in the day to the cold and that back and forth temperature thing is not good for them. Um, so that's kind of the thing for winter. We did, uh, we don't have this run any longer set up, but we did, uh, you can see in this picture here, you, we used to cover our runs with this plastic, rolls of plastic, and we just put furring strips there and wood screws to hold the plastic in place. So that way we could take it down at the end of the winter and reuse it again the next year. Um, and you can get those, that, those rolls of plastic uh, to last you for a couple seasons before they start ripping. Can you talk about what you do for winter lighting? Yeah, winter lighting. So lighting, that's a great, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a great issue. Um, whether to light your coop or not is also a, a thing, right? You have to make that decision. So chickens are born with the number of eggs in them that they're gonna ha ha lay in their lifetime. It's 600 and something. That's how many eggs they're born with, depending on the breed. Um, so they will lay those eggs according to the hours of daylight. So a chicken needs 16 hours of daylight and that stimulates their pineal gland to lay the egg. In the winter, we're not getting 16 hours of daylight. You're getting you know, 10, 11 maybe, if you're lucky, um, maybe even less. So they, they will take a break in the winter and not lay every single day, generally speaking. So if you would like, there's a, you know, there's a lot of thought on this. Like, do you wanna just let them have that natural break? Let them be the natural animal they are. Um, let them focus on keeping their bodies warm um, and not worry about laying eggs. Um, that's one way to look at it. If you, if you're not needing the eggs and you're not trying to run some sort of a, you know, a business of where you need these eggs, um, or you can uh, force them to lay in the winter by adding light to their coop. And that can be done a variety of ways. Um, I've done it a couple different ways. I go back and forth. Generally, um, I think with this, with this new, uh, production flock, I probably will add a light because any way you look at it, you know, they're going to be probably done laying by the time they're two. So I feel like I might as well maximize it while I have them. Um, so uh, you can do a couple of things. You can use regular incandescent bulbs um, and you can set up a timer. And what I would suggest if you do this is um, it's nice to add just a couple hours of daylight at the end of their day. So you can set a timer up and buy timers where at, when the sun sets, it'll trigger the, um, the light to turn on and then it will stay on for you know, two or three extra hours. So it, you know, it's getting dark at 5 p.m. The light goes on, it stays on till 7 or 8 p.m. Tricks them into thinking it's a little longer day. You can also do that in the morning where it comes on earlier in the morning um, and just have it on for a couple hours. I would not leave a light on all night long uh, ever in a coop. Um, it's not good for the birds. They don't ever get a true real rest. Um, I think you'll have more problems um, with their health if you were to do that. Um, so I would just do a gradual thing. One product I'm going to mention because I'm in love with it is called Henlight. And I think it's just henlight.com. But I did buy uh, their smaller uh, backyard um, light a couple years ago. And they have a couple different versions. They have a really large one for really uh, large flocks. And if you're super, you know, big building with a lot of production, I might end up upgrading to that larger one with this bigger building. But the, but the small one is pretty, pretty good for a decent sized coop. Um, and the way it works, so I love this company because they've chosen one thing to be really good at. They're gonna make the best lighting system for hens that exists in the world. And that's all they're gonna focus on. Um, so this light, I mean, they've done all the science. They know exactly the right um, UV rays and what shades of orange, red, and yellow they need to incorporate into that light to mimic um, and it will to stimulate the pineal gland of the hen. So, so this light, um, it runs, you can get the solar panel option. So it runs on a solar panel. It doesn't need electricity. Uh, um, and you basically install it. They tell you exactly at what angle to have it um, shining on the roost of your chickens. And the way theirs is set up is it turns on early in the morning. Um, so you 
it has a little, it, it's so smart. It has a computer in it and it calculates the hours of daylight from the day before. So it knows that it's got a light diode. So it knows when the sun rises and the sun sets. It calculates that we had 10 hours of daylight yesterday. So now it's going to give you six extra hours of daylight to make the 16 hours. And it, it's so it'll turn on. It knew that sunrise was at 730. It's going to turn on, um, you know, at like three in the morning and give you a couple hours then and a couple hours at night. Um, and it's going to gradually go on. So it's a real soft, gradual light that comes on on the birds and it's pointing at them on their roost. Um, and I saw uh, probably a 50% increase in production in egg in, in my hatch in my egg rate egg laying rate um, when I started using that light. It took about a week for it to be running and it was it was amazing. So uh, it's a great product. Uh, and if you're serious about production throughout the winter, I would look into that as well. Um, and while I'm um, repping other products, I'll also rep our automatic chicken doors, which we love. And this is, um, I think the website is chickendoors.com. There's a bunch of chicken doors out there. We like this one the best. We have three or four of them. Um, I prefer it for a couple of reasons. Um, it comes in a variety of sizes, which is nice. I like that it opens out um, versus opening in. A door that opens in can often be pushed in by a predator. So we like the open out option. Um, this one, you can get it um, so it runs on a solar panel. So there's no need for electricity. I have all mine on solar panels and I've used them in the dead of winter, year after year, rainy, cloudy, gray days with no sun and I've never had them not work. So th that battery is really great. It stores a lot of energy. Um, it opens, we have a light diode on these that uh, will sense the sunrise. So at sunrise, it'll open the, the door and it senses the sunset. And at sunset, it will close the door. And then it opens the door one more time for any straggling chickens that didn't make it in at night and will close again. Um, it's also very gentle. I've had a, a hen get caught in it where it shut on her and it doesn't harm them. It just holds her in place until I get there to release her. Um, so it's a great door. Um, I would strongly encourage you to get it. It's peace of mind to know that like, you know, your chickens are getting in and out at night. You don't have to rush home from a fun night out to make sure the door is locked. <laughs> um, so, so it's really a great product. Um, yes, I think the only thing I'll mention here about the coop is how much space you need. Generally, if your chickens are uh, inside the coop sleeping area, that's just the area where they're gonna be at night, is two to four square feet per chicken is a general um, really you know, nice space for them. Um, and that's assuming if they're gonna be out somewhere else during the day, free ranging preferably, but out in, in some space. If they're being contained um, during the day um, in a run, um, generally they say eight to 10 square feet per chicken, which is a lot of space. But I mean, if, if you're never letting them out and you want them to, to not uh, develop captive behaviors and I, I've had chickens before where I've kept them locked up too long and they start pecking each other um, and you know, they're just not healthy birds. Um, they need the space they need. So that's important. Um, okay, so that's kind of, let's see what else we, we're getting down to 940. So I wanna make sure we talked about food already. I'm not gonna get into any of that anymore. Behavior items of chickens. I don't think I'm gonna really get too deep into that. One thing I will mention is it's super important to have a way for your chickens to take a dust bath. Um, this is how they keep themselves clean and keep the lice and mites off of them. Um, you don't want a lice or a mite infestation in your coop. It's hard to deal with. Um, so if you provide some sort of a dry um, spot in your barnyard, in your farm, in their coop, whether that's um, just you know loose dirt, um, some sand is great. They will find a nice sunny, a dirty spot somewhere on your farm to, to dust bathe. And, and they love to do this. It's a communal um, activity. You'll see a bunch of them together doing this, um, keeping themselves clean. You can also add diatomaceous earth to a dust bath area. It's good for them. And you can add wood ash from your wood burning fireplace. Um, that wood ash is very, very good at keeping them clean, killing the lice and mites. It also, um, if they eat some of it, that's good for them. It's high in magnesium and some other vitamins. Um, so that's one good way to help them stay clean. Um, one other thing I'll just mention is every fall, your birds are going to go through a molt. That's when they lose some of their feathers and regrow their feathers. It takes a lot of protein to grow a, a new feather. So some chicken owners will, will uh, add protein to their hen's diet at this point, um, maybe add some uh, higher protein chick starter, something like that. This is what a molt looks like. You see this bird in the back. 
is uh, she didn't molt or she had what is called a soft molt that year. And you couldn't really even tell she'd lost any feathers. Her sister, on the other hand, had a hard molt and, you know, basically overnight lost almost all of her feathers and had to grow them back. They're very sensitive to touch at this stage of the game um, when they're growing their feathers back. So I try not to handle them um, while this is happening. Um, yeah, injuries, diseases, we could have a whole hour talk on that. And, and you know, we'll have to look, about, look at that for a, another time. Um, let's see, the, the only other thing I think I'll mention here is, um, I'll talk just briefly. I think now let's talk about eggs. I think that's probably the, the most important thing. So um, eggs. Like I said, I can't get that page to, to load up, so we don't need to look at that. Um, so for the eggs, uh, I, I kind of want to know if you guys have any specific questions on processing. I'll tell you about what I use, what I do for the washing, the candling, and all that thing, all of that. Uh, and if you have any specific questions, please add them to the chat. Um, first of all, you're going to need uh, some licensing if you're going to get into this through the state. You need an egg handling and an egg candling license if you're going to sell retail or wholesale uh, of your eggs. So um, that's what I have. And there's two types of handling licenses. One is a class A and one is a class B. Um, the class A, it's the same testing for both, um, but um, I went ahead and upgraded to the class B. The class B is for someone who um, is selling 90 dozen eggs in one transaction. So it's more of a wholesaler license. Um, Rarely have I done 90 dozen in one transaction. I've done 75 dozen in one transaction, but because I'm up there in that higher category, I I keep getting the wholesale license each year. Um, it's a little more expensive, but I just kind of want to cover my bases in case anyone comes looking for me. <laughs> um, but the, the class A handling license is a smaller deal and, you know, pretty much if you're just selling out of a farm stand at a farmer's market, um, that would suffice for you. Um, also, along with that, you get a candling license. Um, the process to get these licenses is pretty simple um, through the state. I think the actually the dairy inspector guy is the one who's working it right now. Um, they basically sent me a packet in the mail. I read through all the codified regulations here in our state for eggs. Um, and then you do an open book test. Then the inspector comes out and he grades your test, shows you how to candle and just answers any questions you have. And there you have it. Um, I find it interesting. He didn't even look at my chickens. He, it, was, it was kind of strange, but <laughs> whatever works. Um, so that's the the the, the licensing um, for washing. I've gone through a variety of different egg washers, uh, starting at the very basic, which was an egg washer we made out of PVC piping. You can find this on YouTube. You basically have a five gallon bucket of warm water, and you have this PVC. Um, thing that you made that you've poked holes in and you uh, hook it up to your air compressor and it it it, um, it adds bubbles to the water and basically you put your eggs in a little egg basket and drop them in there and they kind of um, clean through agitation. Um, that works great in small if you're not washing a bunch at a time. Um, we use that for a while, like I said, when we were smaller. Uh, we then upgraded to something called the little egg scrubber, which is an in sync um, electrical uh, egg washer that has bristles and you can you wash three eggs at a time they roll around on the bristle and then you take them off um, that was pretty pretty good I went through two of them unfortunately because the engine burned out after so many hours of usage um, so so then I, I finally upgraded to a, a larger egg washer which you can see here it's called the Gibson Ridge farm egg washer and if you just go gibson ridge egg washer on google you'll find that they have a website it's a farmer a farmer couple out of ohio that designed this and they have it um made for you if you order one it's pretty nifty um i can't remember the numbers but i think it's like 1600 eggs an hour if you're really just going for it but it's basically got an in feeding tray and an out feeding tray um, it sits across uh, the top of a of a sink and it's got bristles on the inside and like a conveyor belt. So it runs the egg through. Um, if you had two people operating that, you could really wash a lot of eggs at once. Um, with one person, it's a little more uh, clumsy, um, but it's still better than any egg washer I've ever had before. And I've had this one for almost two years now. And really it's just, I've had, the only maintenance you have to do with it is um, you have to oil, add some oil periodically um, to it. And then the belts that run it, do snap after a while. So I always have backup belts on hand and they're very easy to, to trade out um, once you need to do that. But 
it's a it's it's not it's not inexpensive once again and and i would say that we're our our food system needs some um some companies that will focus on smaller scale operations like mine and make products like this for us because um it's really it's hard to find these kind of products and when you do find them there the price is pretty high and and uh prohibitive sometimes for smaller operations so so yeah, but we need more more production of, of of infrastructure for smaller smaller farming um, organizations and companies. Um, but that's a so this is a great setup. We've got a commercial sink here. We basically run the eggs through here. Um, I take all the eggs inside and I candle them inside because you do need to candle in a dark room. And so the candling, I'll show you my candling light. Once again, this is an area where I wish we had better products for my size operation. Um, but this is the one I've been using most recently, clips onto a table. Um, it's got a nice rubber gasket here. So when you hold your egg up to it, it doesn't crack. Um, it's very bright. Uh, it's been working really great for me. And, and you can get a setup where you're kind of pretty quick candling each egg. Um, you, are, uh, you are required to candle every egg that you sell. Um, and when I first got started, I wasn't 100% candling every egg, and I, I didn't understand what the what the importance of that was. But I can tell you right now, it is very important. It's it's more important than the washing, almost in my opinion, because I find um, hairline cracks in my eggs that you cannot see with the naked eye um, that are super important to to know about before you're going to sell an egg to somebody. Um, I find all kinds of things with the candler. You'll find small meat spots, small blood spots. Um, those are fine for, for everyone to eat, but I, but I don't, you know, people don't like that when they crack open an egg and see that. So um, I generally keep those eggs for us to eat here at home. Um, obviously, you can also see any embryo development uh, if that accidentally happened at some point in your, uh, in your process. If you had a hen that was sitting on a nest, um, you can see that right away. Uh, another interesting thing that you can see is um, you know, the egg um, has, uh, has, maybe we don't know, but eggs are porous, right? Their shell is porous. And the blunt end of the egg um, has an air sac. That's basically where um, it's going to suck air in through its pores over time. And that air sac is going to um, grow bigger and bigger. And what you'll get when you get your license, your candling license, is this little cool chart. And this is how you determine the, the grade of your eggs is through candling. So you've seen, in, you know, I'm sure you've seen there's grade AA and grade A eggs available for sale generally. So that, all that means is how old the egg is. So this has got a little, a little measure here. I don't know if you can see that down here. And you can um, put this on the candling light. You'll be able to see the, the little air sac will appear up here and you can measure the size of it. If the air sac is one eighth inch or less, you have a grade double A quality egg. If the air sac is three sixteenths of an inch um, or more, well, I guess around that size, one eighth to three sixteenths, it'll be a grade A quality egg. You can still sell that egg retail. retail. If you're getting into this three eighths inch or larger air sac, that's a B quality egg. And that actually can't be sold per USDA regulations as a whole egg. Those eggs are used for powdered egg product and liquid egg product in commercial agriculture. Um, so if I get like a grade B quality egg, I will keep those and we'll eat those ourselves. They're perfectly fine to eat, they're just older. And so what's happening as the egg age, ages, um, as that air sac gets bigger and bigger, it just, um, you're getting a, a lower quality of egg. The, the white is gonna get a little runnier, a little thinner, the yolk won't be, maybe quite as, um, it might break open and, and not stay intact when you crack the egg into the frying pan. So the quality of the egg is depleting as it ages. Um, so all the eggs that I'm selling are the double egg quality and some of them don't even have uh, an air sac. So, so if you go to look for your air sac and you don't see one, that means your egg is so fresh that there's no air in it at all. Um, but it's kind of good to understand that grading um, situation. Um, and then also you are labeling your eggs appropriately, whether you're selling a grade double A or a grade A. Um, so the, and so another thing you'll see with the candling is you'll see um, sometimes a, 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 a ruptured or a, a, a detached air sac. So that air sac that usually sits right there in the blunt end will be a floating loose throughout the egg. Um, once again, that egg is fine to eat, but I don't sell those eggs. We eat those ourselves because um, it, it will 
decrease the quality of the egg and you'll get a runnier white and, and, and problems with the yolk. So when I'm going into restaurants, I am selling a product that is way higher quality nutritionally and taste and everything than a, a Cisco egg off the truck, right? Um, and I'm asking my chefs and my restaurants to pay twice as much for my eggs. A, a, a Cisco egg is 17 cents. I'm, I'm asking 29 cents an egg. So I'm asking them to double their price and I wanna make sure that the quality of the product I'm selling them is gonna meet that, right? And they're gonna be happy with the fact that they spent more money. Um, so that's kind of like some scoop on the ha handling and candling. Um, I didn't touch on uh, any of like the business side of like record keeping and bookkeeping and invoicing and payroll, but you know, that's kind of a, a common, that's a whole nother hour probably conversation um, itself. Um, I will say one more thing before we have any other questions um, is I want to just talk about marketing a little bit. So assuming that since you're all here at this conference, I assume you understand and maybe are in agreement that our current food system is broken and we are trying to create a better, uh, more vibrant, diversified, local, regenerative, sustainable food system um, by what we all do and why, and that's why we're here and part of this organization. Um, so part of that is, is being creative, right? Being creative in the business model that you've designed and then being creative in your marketing. When I started this egg business, there, there was only maybe one or two people who were kind of lightly doing this in this area, selling eggs to restaurants um, in a wholesale fashion. Um, you basically have to create your own market. I spend a lot of my time just cold calling restaurants, going into restaurants and meeting with chefs one-on-one, -on -one, sitting down with them at a table, um, bringing some um, fact sheets on the health benefits of pasture ranged or free range eggs, um, letting them understand the difference between that egg off the truck and the egg they're buying from me. Really like breaking it down because so many people don't understand that. They don't even see a need to be buying eggs from me. Like I'll walk in on some chefs and why are, you know, why am I, why am I even there? They don't, they don't understand what I'm doing or what I'm talking about because they don't really know there's a difference between the egg off the truck and my egg and, and why that's important to support a local producer. So there's a lot of education in your marketing, um, but also you have to do it in a way that, you know, isn't offending someone or, or uh, telling them their way is wrong. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting and it takes a lot of work. Um, I have taken a couple online marketing classes specifically geared towards small sustainable farming businesses. So if you want links to any of those, you can um, reach out to me. And then obviously Dakota Rural Action has this Farm Beginnings class, which is amazing. And I took that a couple of years ago and I would strongly encourage anyone who's thinking about going into any of these um, agriculture businesses to take a class like that. Um, it's, it's, it covers all the bases. You, you cover the marketing, you cover the record keeping, the bookkeeping, the insurance, you know, the ins and outs, the holistic planning of incorporating your business in with your life. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's all, it's all good to, to educate yourself as much as possible um, before you get into this. So let's see, we're, we have about five minutes left. Um, I don't know if there's, has there been any questions, Laura? Is there any in new the questions? chat? Bill's put in some good comments. If people want to read through those, um, just tips for raising poultry. And then Shane has a question on, do you have any suggestions of how to get local city ordinances changed for raising chickens within city limits? Yeah, that's, um, we've done a lot of work. Our chapter here, homegrown out of, uh, from Dakota Real Action, we've done a lot of work with some of the local communities to help them change those ordinances. Um, first of all, homegrown was, uh, that's who actually got the Sioux Falls ordinance in place in 2010 and 2011. So we have a long history of working with communities, organizing communities uh, for things that they want, such as this. We recently did the Brandon um, chicken ordinance. We worked with them and we're currently working with Hartford right now to help them. I think one of the most important things is try to get, um, get a good solid group of folks in your community, right, that are, that are on board. That want to see what you want to do, want the same thing you want. Um, start meeting with them. Start having sharing meals with them. Start talking about a plan. Um, kind of get uh, your ducks in a row. Get some copies of other chicken ordinances. I know the way Hartford is doing it um, has been really great so far. They started a Facebook group and um, are gaining um, gaining people that are interested that way. They're having regular um, meetings and events where those people can come together and get to know each other. They are having like like in-depth meetings where they've looked at the chicken ordinance from Brandon and Sioux Falls. They've written their own based on those two. Um, 
they went through the formal process of, of figuring out what, like me talking to the city council, figuring out what that formal process looks like for introducing a chicken ordinance, talking to each city councilor, um, having coffee with them, kind of trying to educate them on why. Um, we've also done some marketing uh, help with them, marketing like social media campaigns on busting chicken myths, basically, you know, like chickens are smelly, chickens are noisy, um, and, and just educating people on why that's not true. Um, so yeah, and, and I personally would be interested in, in helping with that in, in lots of communities around the state. So reach out to me one on one and, and I'd love to, to help with that. Um, and then I, what I typically do is, is I, I have gone to a number of these city council meetings to speak um, on chicken keeping in general. And then I always offer the council, um, you know, free chicken keeping classes that I will come and teach in their community to make sure people are keeping their chickens in a healthy, respectful manner. Any other questions? Wonderful. We've got a couple more comments in the box if anyone wants to take some time and look through those. Um, but are there any questions in that? We've got a couple minutes left. I'm gonna read through these comments as well. Um, Bill commented salmonella. Is that a question or something you wanna discuss? It's a big deal. It's being warned about all the time, backyard chickens. Oh, I know. Isn't that a great one, Bill? I mean, it, it is a real thing, right? We all know you can get salmonella from the feces, from the waste, uh, from the droppings of chickens. It can be in, in, in eggs. Um, from what I, I have studied, and, and I, I could probably pull up all my, I wrote a, a big paper on this and I don't have it handy, but um, I'm not one to follow the fear, the fear tactics of the media. So um, typically when they have those outbreaks, of salmonella in backyard chickens. The numbers, um, when you look at the actual numbers, the numbers of those, those outbreaks are so minuscule and such a small, small, small percentage of the salmonella or foodborne illness outbreaks that exist. Um, it's very rare to have it come from backyard chickens. Obviously you need to wash your hands. After handling them, you, you, know, you should have specific shoes that are your chicken shoes that go out and don't come into the house. You know, just general common sense rules. And with children, you have to watch them and make sure their hands are clean and all of that stuff. Um, I've been handling a lot of eggs and a lot of chickens for a lot of years. And so far, no one in my family or anyone I know has had salmonella from chickens. So <laughs> should knock on wood, but. <laughs> Oh, I love Bill. I love all your 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 um, tips. These are great. The the milk to the water. I've heard that one. That's great. Oh, and then yes, Bill mentions that during the winter, hens generally do not want to go outside. They don't like the snow. I'm I've tried having a snow free area, but they don't appear interested in going out. It's true. Some chickens won't. I find that the heritage breeds that still have their chicken instincts intact are more likely to want to be outside. And I always, um, we use our ATV and a plow and we shovel a path at least out to the barn and the barnyard so they have a space to go to. Um, if I, I find that if I shovel some space for them, mine still generally go out. And if they don't, I will encourage them out with some scratch grains or some cracked corn or just some straw that they can then peck through. Um, and I try to get them to come outside. I think it's better for their health to get out and about as much as possible. And yes, um, so pecking, if, if you have chickens pecking other chickens, Bill commented about the purple antiseptic. Um, it's called Blue Coat, B-L-U-K-O-T-E. It's very good at disguising um, any injuries on a bird so that the other birds don't peck at it. Yes. And I'll say one, one, one other comment Bill made about the clean versus washed versus unwashed eggs, 100% agree. Um, we have to wash our eggs per our regulations here in the state or in this, in this country. Um, in Europe, they don't, they don't wash their eggs. The less handling of the egg, the better. They keep their nest boxes really clean. Um, so the egg doesn't get dirty from the, from the get-go. But when the egg is laid, it's covered in a bloom, which is an antimicrobial and antibacterial coating that keeps bacteria from entering that shell. Um, and once you wash the egg, you've washed the bloom off and, and you are exposing the egg to bacteria. So yes, I agree. Like it'd be, it'd be way better to not wash your egg. Um, I wash mine because I have to, but uh, yeah, for my own personal uh, usage, I don't wash them. I wanted to just mention this thing about banding because you mentioned that early on and I had a horrible 
season with banding ones where I banded the chickens, hens when they were young. And as they got older, that banding got tighter and tighter. And I spent hours taking those huh. bands off because they not expand. Yeah, that's a good point, Bill. Thanks for bringing that up. I think it's um, important either to get if, or wait, wait and try to band later, maybe when they're older or get, um, I know you can get varying sizes of bands now. I don't know. Um, you know, if that would work or not. But yeah, that's definitely something to consider and, and keep in mind. And thank you for your comments on the deep litter method, because I need all the help I can get with trying to make this work. Too many, too many birds for the area. Yeah. Ah, good to know. Any other questions for Stephanie to pick her brain now? Otherwise, Stephanie, do you have an email that you can type into the chat if people have more questions for you or need to get in touch? Yes, um, I do. Let me stop sharing my screen here. I'll type my, uh, my phone and my email into the chat and you guys can reach out to me anytime. Um, let's see here. Thank you so much. And then for those of you who are able to stick around for the next session, your two options are growing farm to school or plants, passions, and problems. So hopefully one of those um, works out for you. And then I'd also encourage you to stick around for the South Dakota Local Foods Coalition meeting at 1130 and the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association meeting at 1230 Central. With that, thank you all very much. Thank you, Stephanie, for all of the knowledge that you shared. And thank we'll you, everybody. All the way to through the day. Welcome, we'll give it another minute or two for others to join the room. Um, if you're in this room, the topic that we're covering is growing farm to school. So if that's what you're looking for, just stick tight for a couple minutes. All right, I think we'll get started right now. So got 1020 on my clock. Some of you might have 920, but we'll get started with Anna Barr is here to talk to us about growing the farm to school programs. Anna is a registered dietitian and serves as a farm to school nutrition field specialist for SDSU Extension. She graduated from SDSU with a master's degree in, in nutrition and exercise science. While an undergraduate at SDSU, Anna completed a minor in horticulture. From her upbringings on a small farm in Iowa and sustainable food and agricultural internships across the world, Anna developed a passion for improving human nutrition in ways that are sustainable for both food systems and the population they serve. So she is here today to talk to us about the Farm to School program. And I'd also like to note that if this is a topic that you're interested in, I'd encourage you to stick around for the coalition meeting which will be um, starting in a little over an hour and she'll visit with you about ways that you can personally get involved if this is an area that you're passionate about as well. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, and Lindsay, I think, can I share my screen? Thank you. Okay. All right, well, I will get started then. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add to that introduction. So thank you, Laura. And okay, get everything situated here. Okay, well, first off, I didn't create an official poll, but um, it, just to get to know the room a little bit, um, it, why don't we put in the chat if it, um, one or more of the following applies to you. So it's okay if, if you put two um, letters in there, but are you a fruit or vegetable producer, meat producer, not a producer, or am I missing an option? It's right, so some fruit and vegetable. We have a meat, kind of a well rounded group meat processors, retailers, and producers from both sides, it looks like. Oh, yep, farm to school project manager. Awesome. Okay. And then the next one is if you are uh, um, selling to schools from the producer side, have you? tried in the past. So the first one would be actively selling. Um, the second would be have sold in the past, but not right now, or have attempted unsuccessfully or don't have um, experience in this area. Selling, that's really good to hear. We're always looking for more case studies of farm to school um, successful happening in the States. I might have to connect with you some. No experience. All right, and then I would just think the rest of us kind of like I would be in these situations are just interested in farm to school and want to know how we can help and um, move it forward from whatever realm we're a part of. So, Okay, this is what we'll be talking about today. So farm to school, go over just the basics of what it is and why it why we do it. Um, I think there's been farm to school sessions in a lot of these local foods conferences. You know, I helped with one two years ago and there'd been more in the past. So I think that if you are someone who's been coming to these, farm to school is something you're aware of. So I'll try to go through that somewhat quickly. And then um, understanding our child nutrition, school nutrition programs. Um, I think this, that's kind of a key objective here is just to help this conference serves the producer side um, to help understand what it's like on the school side of farm to school so that we can um, better prepare for those conversations and understand what the environment is that we're trying to get into. And so then the farm to school census will, will help us with that a bit more in understanding the child nutrition program directors in South Dakota and how they responded about farm to school activities. And then I'll get into some of the current things about supply chain disruptions and the opportunities that exist um, that maybe didn't exist uh, pre-COVID for some uh, flexibilities with the ways that we can sell local foods into school meals and give some opportunities to get growing with farm to school. Okay, so the basic definition here, farm to school changes food purchasing and education practices of education settings to connect communities with fresh, healthy food from local producers. And we have three core elements of farm to school. So I think the thing that we think about most frequently is local procurement, selling to schools from local producers. Um, but what we also have is education. So anything that, that educates a student in a classroom about health, nutrition, or agriculture can be considered farm to school. And a lot of times that could be hands-on or it could be curriculum based and could happen at any, any age level um, and might even be after school in another program too. Um, and then school gardens that could, could relate to education. Um, it could also relate to procurement. So all of these can go together or they can be standalone and, and um, all of which would still qualify as a farm to school program. If you're doing just one component or if, or if all of them are working interchangeably together. 
what is local? We talk about local foods. We might all sort of have a different definition for that. Uh, as far as farm to school goes, there's no set definition nationally um, or statewide in our state that any, everyone must follow. So this example of the photos here shows Pierre. You could say within a, oh, I don't, maybe that's about a three or 400 mile radius. I'm not sure, but um, could be could be the the radius and that would touch on more states than just South Dakota. You could say that the local means within the state of South Dakota or you could bring it more um, more tight than that and say within about a 50 mile radius of Pierre. Um, and some examples from uh, quite a few years ago now the 2015 USDA farm to school census listed some of the responses from food service directors across our state and Aberdeen had had written at that time within a hundred mile radius and Westington Springs had said um, produced in the state of South Dakota. So there is variety um, there as to what, what schools will consider to be local. Why farm to school? What are the, the good things that come about from these programs? So we've got multiple stakeholders that can win in farm to school kids, environment, school food service, farmers, and the community. So I've got some, some stats here down. So the kids, um, they receive access to nutritious food and enhanced classroom education, thinking about those different components of farm to school. So they're, they're getting some in-class education, maybe. They're getting some hands-on experiences in the garden. They're getting fresh local foods. Um, so they can benefit from any one of those, those components or all of them. The environment wins from reduced food waste. Kids are eating more of their fruits and vegetables. Um, those are typically the studies that we see in Farm to School are about fruits and vegetables. I know Farm to School is about more than just that, but, but most of the research is on fruits and vegetables. So, so we're eating more of it, we're wasting less of it, and the environment wins there. Also with reduced um, transportation, if you're coming from a local area, uh, those, those pollutants into the air are not as, as much as if you're just traveling across the country. School food service wins by seeing an average 9% increase in school meal participation, as well as the reputation that they gain in the community for having a robust and, and healthy program for kids. Farmers win by the financial opportunity to new markets. The school oftentimes, um, it, a fun way to think about it, is the largest restaurant in town. Um, and especially I think in South Dakota when our schools, um, we, our town might not even have a restaurant. So, um, yeah. And then communities win by building the engagement that it takes around um, the different stakeholders and farm to school coming together to make it happen and then um, strengthening the local economy. Some more fun stats here on why farm to school students have an increased 0.99 to 1.3 servings of fruit and vegetables per day, uh, which helps minimize the risk of diet related diseases. Their knowledge about gardening, agriculture, healthy food, local food and seasonality increases. And they're more willing to try new and healthy foods that are different or they might not have seen them prior to the foods being provided to them at school through a farm to school program. And they actually choose healthier foods at school and at home after being exposed to, to these foods at school. And for producers, um, and one study that, that was referenced by the National Farm to School Network was that producers see an average income increase of 5% and increased market diversification. All right, understanding child nutrition programs. <laughs> um, and I think that this is something that can be a bit, you know, daunting. We think about, oh my gosh, farm to school, USDA, federal nutrition program, so many regulations. And, and I've got partners, I'm not sure if they're on today, but at the Child and Adult Nutrition Services office at CANS that, that are the experts in this. Um, but just as an overview, you know, these regulations for what, what can be served at child nutrition programs and the policies that are followed come from the USDA Food and Nutrition Service. And then the state agency that administers that program in South Dakota is the Department of Education, Child and Adult Nutrition Services Office. And then, and then each school food authority um, must follow these, but also might have some of their own that they use to protect their programs too. So something to be noted is that the USDA and our South Dakota CANS office are both very 
proud of Farm to School. They both they want to see it happen. They want to support more of it happening um, and, and to eliminate barriers to making Farm to School happen. And, and they've been working on that. Um, so, so that's kind of a common thing we think of though the regulations are just too tight, but um, there, there, there can be difficulties, but, but we do have um, systems that are supportive and people, people in our corners to make farm to, to school happen um, across our state. Um, I think that some of the challenges do come most often from the local schools and and maybe some thoughts that they might have about, about farm to school or um, some of their own rules that they might have in play just to protect themselves. Um, and when we're talking about federal child nutrition programs, there's a few different ones. We have the school lunch program, the national school lunch program, that's going to be our most common one. The school breakfast program, it works in conjunction with the lunch program typically, but served at breakfast time. The fresh fruit and vegetable program, which I'll talk a little bit about more later, serves um, fresh fruit or vegetable snacks to elementary students um, throughout the school day outside of the meal. Um, and is, is for your more low income schools to, to offer. Um, and then the summer food service program throughout the summertime, uh, if, if schools are operating at um, summer school or if they just wanna offer food to students when they're um, outside of school hours, they can come into the school and have school food over the summer. And then the child and adult care um, food program, which would be your after school programs, preschools, things of that nature, which are another small group. Um, that, that could be really um, a niche to get into because they, they are off operating these programs also, but they um, they don't have as many people to serve and they might be more willing to um, to offer something new or different since, since it's a smaller scale. Um, and speaking about the USDA, um, they have created a whole office for, for farm to school programs. It's the Office of Community Food Systems. And uh, um, they, this is what their webpage looks like. They have fact sheets and they developed the farm to school census, which we will talk about shortly. And uh, here is the Child and Adult Nutrition Services page from the Department of CANS. Um, and just to reference, they do have a whole section on farm to table resources and uh, a list of the waivers that are in place this year um, due to COVID-19 and the continuing implications on child nutrition programs. So both just demonstrating their, um, their approval of, of local foods and school meals. So what does a school lunch contain? School lunches must offer, it, there's offer five, you must serve three. So our students must take three. There's always a dairy component that's offered, a meat or meat alternative, a vegetable, a fruit, and a grain. And students must choose at least three of those to be included as a full meal. And a fruit or vegetable must be one of those items. And the thing to note here too, when we're thinking about local foods and serving to school meals, local can span the tray, right? We always, we're so much more frequently seeing fruits and vegetables, but in South Dakota, especially we're thinking about meat too, but we could be thinking about dairy or um, those grain products as well. Some of those nutrition requirements, milk must be fat free or low fat, which is 1%, grains, Half of the grains must be whole grain rich, which, which means they're over 50% whole grain. And if not, they must be enriched, which adds some of those vitamins and nutrients back into the grain that are taken out when it's um, a refined grain and not the whole, the whole grain. Fruits must limit juice and choose whole fruits as a, as a guide, but, but all are welcome. Um, vegetables all show the vegetable subgroups next. And then meat and meat alternatives can be a, a variety of things. And some dairy is included in this. So cheese, yogurt, um, maybe soy, yogurt, nuts and seeds are considered a meat or meat alternative. Um, and then of course your meat, poultry, fish. Um, and then there are limits on calories, saturated fats, trans fats, and sodium. So they're always trying to keep those down or within range. The subgroups for vegetables are dark green, red and orange, legumes, um, starchy, 
or other, and each week they're needing to hit certain targets for serving these these vegetable subgroups. So, so just keeping in mind that they're looking for a variety. A variety of colors usually covers your bases there. What do meals cost and what's the reimbursement? So this year, again, um, for, you've probably seen it in the news, but all students are eligible for free lunches. Um, this came about in COVID with the financial concerns um, of, of families and, and feeding our kids. Um, so we, we unfortunately know that, that hunger has increased through COVID-19 and this is a program to address um, especially child hunger. So, so every student is receiving free lunches. The reimbursement rate um, is about 368 per lunch. And that, that comes if the, the meal requirements are followed. Although there are some waivers and flexibilities this year that make, make that not as strict of a requirement um, just because we're foremost trying to make sure kids get fed. Um, and an average cost of what the actual portion of that reimbursement is that comes from the cost of food is 45%. And so when you think about that, they're spending about $1.66 per meal on, on lunch each day. Let's get to know our South Dakota food service directors a little bit better. The USDA has this, this farm to school census. They, they surveyed in 2019, so that's something to think about. It's pretty robust, and so it takes a long time to get all the surveys back, process them, run the data, and get it out. So this just released in July of this year. Uh, but it's a survey of all school food authorities that's pretty much the same as a school district. Um, I can't think of an example where that wouldn't be the case in South Dakota. Um, so, so when you see SFAs, think school district. Um, it's a survey of all of the, of the food service directors, most likely your head cook, what a business manager, whatever that position title is that, that operates the school nutrition program. Um, it has to be participating in the national school lunch program. And it asks about all farm to school activities. So in South Dakota, we had 133 school food authorities respond to the survey, which is 69% of all of our schools in the state. Um, and that represented 433 schools and 97,533 students. So pretty good. What we need to have a representative sample is 80%. So we weren't quite there. So we can't with certainty say that this is totally true of the entire population of South Dakota or a representative sample, but, but it's pretty good. Um, and from that, uh, we had the best representation from rural schools and only 1% of the responses came from urban and suburban. So carrying forward, as I show some of these results, just keep in mind that um, it's mostly coming from our rural schools. Uh, and this is kind of the bad news, unfortunately. So from the results, the percent of school food authorities participating in at least one farm to school activity. So in class education, school gardens, or um, local procurement of any type, uh, we had 44% participation. The national average was 65%. Um, we're the lowest in our region and the lowest nationally. Next one was percent of all school food authorities that are serving local foods. And again, we were at 32% serving local. The national average was 50%. We were the lowest in our region and also the lowest nationally. How do our food service directors define local? 44% have no set definition. 17% don't know. So probably no such definition um, and the rest are pretty scattered. So, so definitely room here to work with schools uh, on what that local definition is. If you feel like you are local enough to connect with them, then, then you probably qualify as local and there's room for, for conversation there. So just something to consider is that they're most likely not already having that definition set um, if you do approach them to sell. In South Dakota, where do our ones that are, so this is from specifically the schools that are, are buying local foods and where do they get them? 41% get them from the USDA Department of Defense FRESH program. Um, and then 24, 
you get directly from individual producers as well as grocery stores and from USDA foods. So individual producers is up there a little ways. And then you can even think about um, they're, they're getting them also from um, farmers markets or roadside stands. Um, and like we see the grocery store here too. So if, if there are different ways that, that our producers here are, are getting foods out into the community, it's possible that, that school foods and restrictors are picking them up in those locations too. This is, this is a neat one. So percent of school food authorities that seek out sources of local foods, uh, South Dakota had 24% that seek local, the national average is 34. You can see we're not the lowest in this one, but, but we are fairly low. So the key takeaway here I think is go to them because it doesn't seem that they're coming to you. Why do they want to do farm to school? The top benefits that our, our school food service directors see Top one is, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's so something we can consider. And I know I will be hearing forward when I'm speaking to food service directors and, and um, our partners will be too, but is educating on what that benefit of from school is so that there's a higher desire to participate. Uh, but that could be something that, that you also take with them is I can provide um, different resources of, of the benefits of farm to school and just kind of sharing what those are so that there's more buy-in from, from our schools. But the top, the, the second highest was higher quality foods. So great kudos to our local food producers who they do believe have, have better quality foods. Uh, they, they also see a benefit of increased consumption of items in school meals, student knowledge about local and healthful foods, and, and maybe even lower school meal program costs. So it, in, depending on who the food service director is and what their, their thoughts are, but of course these conversations can be had about what the cost would be to buy local. Um, the top seven challenges to participate in Farm to School by South Dakota School Food <laughs> Authorities. Um, and these are the ones that are already participating in some way um, that responded to this question. So the top three really seem to go hand in hand and it's that they're not finding local foods. So they, they either claim a limited availability of local foods or it's difficult to find local sources or there's a lack of availability of pre-cut or processed local foods, which sometimes they do get from their vendors um, and, and can be easier. Um, so, so those things to keep in mind here that, that um, either they don't know you're out there or, or we're not in the same places or, or just the expanse of space in between um, farm and school might be a bit bigger than maybe they're, they're considering for what is what is local. So making those connections and helping them know where you're at or maybe getting listed on some of our, our maps in the state um, can help. I, I, I know I reference um, both our Dakota Rural Action Specialty Producers Association's um, maps when I'm talking to food service directors about where they can find local. And I know our CANS office has done the same with those resources. Um, and then the bottom four here um, were a four-way tie. So the, the top challenges, this is why there's seven, because the top, the bottom four all tied was um, they're not getting anything available from primary vendors. Um, there's a lack of variety of local vendors or a lack of staff time for local foods or no challenges. But really the main one, the highest by nearly two times of the second was limited availability of local foods. Um, so whether that's true or not, I can't really speak to, and it's probably different for different parts of the state. But, but if you're out there and you want to do it, making yourself known, I think is the biggest takeaway. Okay, so current current issues happening right now, supply chain disruptions and opportunities. You've probably seen them in the news. It seems to be a bit overwhelming, at least on my emails, um, but there's there's stories left and right. We had a, a good, um, good story in KSFY earlier this year, um, but that that schools are, are struggling to find enough, the food from their normal supply chains can feel a bit overwhelming, especially to your food service directors and consider consider their how they're coping with this too. And if they might be new to their position and this is what they're walking into, they are dealing with a lot right now. Um, this video, I let me double check my um, abilities to share sound. Um, yes, okay. Will it tell us a bit about that backstory behind why there are supply chain disruptions? I've seen that title in the news, but this actually kind of says why. So to help understand that. 
holler if you can't hear it. As the new school year gets underway, school nutrition programs are struggling to secure the necessary food and supplies needed to feed students due to disruptions in the supply chain, product shortages, discontinued items, price increases, distributor cancellations, delayed or canceled deliveries with little to no notice. are just a few of the challenges schools are facing. Add to this staffing shortages across all businesses as well as schools, which are making the challenges even worse. As the pandemic unfolded and meal participation dropped as schools closed, demand for products decreased, resulting in fewer orders from schools to distributors and manufacturers. As a result, manufacturers had to cut personnel and reduce or eliminate items to streamline inventory and manage operational expenses. They also pivoted their businesses from food service to high demand segments, such as retail, to maximize revenue and profitability. Now, with the economy reopened and all at once, demand for products, particularly in the food service segment, is outpacing supply. As a result, supplies are being disrupted at all points of the supply chain, from raw materials to manufacturing to packaging to transporting, largely due to the unprecedented nationwide labor shortage. In addition, businesses can't find enough workers, and this includes delivery drivers. Drivers that once worked in more traditional distribution centers are now employed by popular at-home delivery services that skyrocketed in popularity during the pandemic. We're waiting until the pandemic has subsided before going back to work to ensure their safety. So what can you do? Okay. Oh. Partner with... There we go. All right, so that kind of giving a background about why the supply chain disruptions are happening um, and also hopefully starting to highlight that, that schools need food <laughs> and um, that local producers can be a solution in, in finding that if, if, they're, if they're really facing um, these severely. So the School Nutrition Association um, National Organization, we do have a South Dakota branch also, um, but they have an annual survey of their, their food service directors uh, across the nation. And in 20, for the 2021-2022 school year, they said, please indicate how much of a concern each of the following is at the current time. And just the top um, a couple here, the first one was continued pandemic supply chain disruptions, it's something they're concerned about, and then staff shortages. So things to be aware on what's going on inside of, of the school kitchen. Then the second question was, please indicate whether your program is currently facing the following challenges. And this was nationally, I don't know the South Dakota specific data, but um, the, the top one was menu items discontinued by manufacturer, items not available in sufficient quantities, um, things not coming in when you're expecting them to come, um, or higher cost versus pre-pandemic bids. Um, so these can, again, can be opportunities to kind of step up and say, maybe I can help. So the positives here, um, USDA and uh, South Dakota Cans are suggesting local purchases to their local um, school food authorities who are struggling with, with finding enough food um, and in the right, the right kinds. Um, and then the, there are waivers and flexibilities for the school year um, to make local purchases easier. The bidding process um, that typically was required, um, there's some emergency relief um, in, in effect that, that you can kind of go around that. I don't know the specifics, so I won't try to like mess it up too much, but, but there are things in place that make local easier this year than normal. Um, and but things to think about too. They're they're short staffed. Food service directors are oftentimes working in meal prep because there's just not enough people out there on the floor doing it um, that they can stay and and be working on management. Um, they might have less time for new projects, um, and they're concerned about financial sustainability. Which this one can maybe go in the positive or negative because just depending on on what you can offer and what their other prices were to. Um, but definitely opportunity to, to kind of come in from a maybe I can help standpoint. So let's get growing. Um, one fun little video here, um, just 
brings a face to a food service director. This one is in Arkansas, but um, she's going to talk briefly about tips for selling to schools. So let me get the right spot here. Yeah, well, I would say number one, bring samples. <laughs> you will have, you know, a lot more luck with the competition director when you bring them something tasty to eat. And also, so you can showcase how different the flavor might be or bring some different varieties that maybe they've never seen before. Um, they're used to seeing that from their broker. So to kind of align with that would be great. Um, also, come to the conversation knowing what you need for your farm operation. Um, just so that they can plan accordingly. You can decide together whether it's a good market for your, your operation. Mm -hmm. So probably the, the quickest and most simple explanation for how we manage uh, purchasing relationships with growers is through a bid process. And the type of bidding you do depends on how much you're likely gonna buy from the grower. But we um, have early conversations and we are allowed to share um, previous pricing or current pricing with the grower so they can see if that pricing is going, something similar might work for their, their business. And then they can decide whether they participate in our, our bidding solicitation, all of, you know, all of that that we're required to do. So you can have initial um, conversations about price before that happens. You can't say, you can't tell them, you know, the price to put down, but it's just, I mean, it's open information that anyone could request. Um, and we primarily purchase directly from growers. Um, we have a district warehouse that we can receive the items at, so the growers make one delivery, but um, we do very little local purchasing through distributor or other sort of third party. It's direct from the uh, producer. Okay, and of course each school is going to be a little bit different, um, but but some good thoughts there and and something that um, I didn't really even know either until until listening to that perspective about maybe hearing from them what the prices that they currently use um, have been so you can understand if if your prices might be a good fit or if you're capable of producing to that at that rate. Um, and, and bringing samples, of course, and showcasing the different variety and quality that, that you can offer them. Um, some tips for approaching food service structures. Avoid judgment and don't shame school food. It might get a bad reputation, but it serves a really, really good and high need. Um, be prepared. Look at their menus ahead of time. Kind of understand what they're offering um, typically and how you might be able to, to contribute to that, that cycle menu. Bring samples and marketing materials. Uh, don't show up unannounced. Ask their preferred means of communication. Take time to develop trust um, and host a farm visit maybe. Let them come to you if, if you're trying to kind of outreach and, and show what you have to offer and build relationship and trust. Then hosting a farm visit can be a really good opportunity for that. I do have a worksheet. Um, I did not create it, but it came from um, a training um, for so it's school nutrition director meeting checklist and I can share this um, after words too with anyone who's interested um, just some different things to think about when going into a meeting with the school nutrition director. When is the best time to approach a food service director? This is a, a general overview of what their year looks like. So let's start in the middle here. So August is when we start to think about school food. So um, they're insanely busy until about October. They're still pretty busy. November, kind of busy. December, kind of busy. January, kind of busy. And then, and then it starts to get busy again in February, March. So they're, they're typically planning for those cycle menus in the January, February time range. And so if if you're trying to get in with them on next year's supply and more of that regular um, committed uh, offering of, of some of their cycle menu items, then the best time to do that is January or February when they are planning for the upcoming year. And also when that does tend to overlap a bit with the, the planning time for, for your growing season too. So I think that those are pretty well, um, next to each other and supportive of each other. Um, but things to just keep in mind is, is probably not approaching them in um, 
August or September, and then they might be on vacation in July. Time at mid-afternoon is best. Avoid lunch. They're getting ready for lunch all up until lunch, so that seems to be busy too, and they might be offering breakfast, so really your mid-afternoon is is good. Um, sometimes those the kitchen staff will leave maybe at two o'clock, and then your food service director has a quiet kitchen <laughs> um, from two thirty to four or five, whenever it is that they leave for the day. So that's the best time to approach a food service director. Um, things calm down quite a bit in the afternoons. And then now different ways to get involved. Sell to schools, which we've been talking about. I'll give a couple of the, the maybe different smaller examples for that. Um, host a special event or help at a special event. Farm tours, farmer visits or school presentations, mentor school gardens, or maybe be a farmer pen pal to a classroom. Um, something to keep in mind too is that ways to get involved, it doesn't, you know, when we're selling to schools, typically we're talking with that food service director or the business manager, whatever the person is at the school that makes those decisions. But for farm to school as a whole, you could be connecting with a local teacher, um, or maybe there's someone who, maybe the school guidance counselor runs the school garden, um, and you could be talking to them too. So is finding that that person that is a champion for farm to school is, is really um, a key, important first step. Um, and it might not be who you expect at first, but you can get involved uh, just like schools can in any realm of farm to school, not just procurement. So the school gardens and education components too can be a great way to start to build trust and relationship with a school that could maybe lead to more selling um, down the road as, as that relationship and trust gets built. Speaking of selling, so we've got a couple options that are great for just getting into the market. So salad bars, they are flexible and seasonal. So things that you have available, you don't have to fill out the entire quantity that they need for a salad bar. It could supplement what the order is that they're already getting. You can provide just the things that you have available and it's an easier place to, to work with um, than, than being on the cycle menu, which is pretty um, strict to sticking to that. And the quantities must be for every student, but not every student or faculty member is gonna be coming through the salad bar. So it's a lot more flexible. And the fresh fruit and vegetable program to um, one of the things here is their goal is to introduce students to a new and wider variety of fresh, fresh fruits and vegetables. So it's for whole products. Um, they can be cut, of course, but not cooked or processed. Um, and it can be any fruit or vegetable that you can eat fresh. Uh, and, and really the goal is to, to introduce kids that are especially in low income settings to a variety of new and different fruits and vegetables to increase their health and nutrition. Um, so this can be a great opportunity to get started in that program. Back to some of our census data here for what we're already currently doing in some of these, these realms, um, the percent of school food service authorities that use local foods in the fresh fruit and vegetable program in South Dakota right now is 27. It seems to be happening. Oh, one thing to know about our program too. Um, I was talking with Eric Hans office recently and asked what the, the percent of free and reduced price lunches must be in a school in order to be eligible to offer the fresh fruit and vegetable program. And it's 20% in South Dakota, which is pretty low and is going to encompass a lot of schools. Um, so it's only for elementary schools, but that's, that's a high, I don't know the exact proportion of what um, percent of our schools are 20% um, or greater free and reduced life price lunches, but um, that's a really low, low standard. So as long as they're applying and receiving um, this fresh fruit and vegetable program, many of them are eligible and it's likely that the ones in your community are too. Selling in the summertime, we have many schools offering summer meal programs, not all of them are, um, and there could be child and adult care feeding programs offered throughout the summertime or all year too. Um, so, so that's a hard barrier in the state is our growing season versus our school season, but, but what about what they're offering in the summertime and could you get involved there? More fresh produce is available at that time and the meals are probably smaller, which can be easier to get started with. Uh, our status right in 2019 for school food authorities serving local foods in the, so this is the um, 
Summer Food Service Program or the Seamless Summer Option, both of which are just different acronyms for federal nutrition programs that are served in the summertime. Um, and we were kind of middle of the road there. Special events. We just got done with our, our October was Farm to School Month and there's a, a event called the Mountain Plains Crunch Off. Um, and so we're advertising to schools and uh, different organizations um, to participate in the crunch by biting into something local um, during the first week of October. So we were encouraging them to go out and find local producers. But if you know that this event is happening, you can definitely approach your school or a classroom or a club or anything and, and say, I want to be able to offer you this produce and you can offer to donate it, but, but we're not saying that it's going to be donated. You know, they're the goal is to also stimulate the local economy. So um, being the one to, to sell to them um, can be a great opportunity to just start in with something. And it doesn't have to be an apple, it can be anything crunchy that you've got available that beginning of October. Percent of um, school food authorities that host farm to school related family and community events, we were pretty high on that. Um, some different ideas would be parent lunch days. Maybe they want to have a really good meal for parents to come in and eat, or maybe they're hosting a Thanksgiving meal and they want to be able to offer higher quality foods. Maybe you could provide at that time. Um, other fun things that would qualify as events, schools have done corn shucking competitions um, or even farmers markets too. Host a farm field trip. How fun would this be? Uh, bring the students out. They can learn about foods. They can see your operation. Um, currently, we're a little below the average on this, um, but, but something fun to, to consider implementing. And I know it does happen across South Dakota. Zip the school. Uh, go in. Maybe you can help them with their, their school garden, too, or bring, bring some of your fresh local produce, and they can try it or help a teacher with a lesson. Um, there's a bunch of resources out there for different activities that they can still learn about math or science or whatever it is that they're learning about and incorporate local foods. So maybe there's a fun opportunity for you to go visit a school or to visit just a classroom um, and, and help them learn about, about growing food because that's your expertise area. And uh, again, kind of right on with that national average for currently visiting cafeterias, classrooms, or the school setting. School gardens, you could be a great mentor to a school garden. Uh, this is an example out in Lake Andes, um, which I'm just looking, Mary Jo is on our call. So <laughs> you, this is where you are. But um, one example here, just and this isn't specifically a school garden, but it is near a school garden. And just thinking about other schools, if you do happen to have a school garden in your community um, that, that you could assist them with, be the mentor to, maybe even help with the botany club if the high school has one or the horticulture club or the, the meat science club um, or your FFA in some way um, to get established and um, helping them learn what it means to garden and how. And also helping the teachers too, because one last slide here about the, um, the census, but our percent of school food authorities with at least one edible garden was the lowest in our region and the lowest nationally again. So not only um, are we helping the schools that, that have school gardens, but we could be helping them to establish a school garden and, and offer maybe assistance there um, as, as a potential idea for, for getting engaged. Okay. I'll be wrapping up here with a few of our resources. So SDSU Extension produced in 2019, the South Dakota Farm to School Resource Guide, which is available on our website. And I'll provide um, the links um, in follow-up too. And we are, I am working on revising this for a new edition um, within the next year. So keep your eyes out for that. In August, we published the frequently asked questions about serving bison and beef in USDA child nutrition programs in South Dakota, and that's also available on our website, um, and I can provide the link to that and follow up as well. The Farm to School grants, they just became available on October 22nd. This is an annual USDA Farm to School grant program. Um, applications this year are due on January 10th. They are anywhere from there's one track of grants that are 50,000 and the other is 100,000. Um, it could be planning, um, implementation, growing of a certain project, um, uh, lots of opportunities for the different types of grants and the different entities here um, do include 
uh, small to medium sized agriculture producers or groups of small to medium sized agriculture producers um, and nonprofit organizations. So if that's any of you, um, I encourage you to attend our webinars about this grant program. It's newly released, so it's a great time to start learning about it and thinking about um, if you would like to apply. Uh, we've had a number of successful farm to school grants in our state um, in recent years. This year, um, Red Cloud School has a farm to school grant as well as Youth and Family Services of Rapid City and both for different projects. Um, so on November 22nd, uh, I'll be hosting along with Andrea Alma, our USDA farm to school regional lead who administers um, this grant uh, for our region. Um, we'll be talking about what it means to apply, how to apply, what the different options are, some examples of, of projects in the past. Um, and so definitely encourage and welcome you to attend. I, again, can um, share this calendar invite um, to, to anyone who is interested in attending this meeting. Um, and then there are two national webinars coming up next week. Um, on November 8th and 9th about the request for applications and then on putting together a grant application. So um, I would first off encourage you to attend the South Dakota one if possible, because that's going to touch on all of the information from the national webinars and also provide more of an opportunity to see the person who you would be applying to, which is Andrea, and to ask questions of her and, and get more of that South Dakota specific rural audience that she understands our state very well. So um, would not need to attend all of these, but if you're not available during the South Dakota one, maybe those national webinars would be things to, to attend instead. Um, so I would say if you want me to send you the calendar invite to our South Dakota webinar, or if you aren't on the list that already um, got it, then, then maybe send me your email address um, through the chat. You can do it privately if you'd like to, or um, you could email me um, at my email address there. Um, and otherwise, I did hear that there's some follow-up information going out. So I have a list of all of the resources that I've provided in this um, presentation, and I will send those um, through with the email that goes up in follow-up. So um, all of those can be available to all of you. Um, and upcoming next, we have the South Dakota Local Foods Coalition meeting, um, and I'll be talking a bit about how to get engaged with our farm to school um, subcommittee. So if you're interested in that, definitely excited to um, continue this conversation and bring the goal there is to bring more people into the conversation about how we move forward with farm to school in our state and how to best address some of these barriers to, to seeing programs um, go forward successfully. So definitely welcome you to join and learn a little bit more in, at 1130 year. Um, but with that, send me your email address if you want the calendar invite for our November 22nd Farm to School Grant uh, meeting. And um, otherwise, I yeah welcome questions. We do have one question in the chat. Um, Gabby asked, does SDSU Extension Farm to School Services have any conversations or efforts around diversifying leadership and increasing racial equity in farm to school across the state? And she has some other thoughts there too, if you want to look through that and respond a little bit more oh, or she mentioned it might be a good question for the coalition as well hmm. stop my face i can see these a bit better and then meanwhile if anyone else has any questions for anna that you want to throw in the chat um so this is the first part of the question right now um yes <laughs> um we I have also recognized that, um, so in our first meeting um, of the Farm to School Local Foods Subcommittee, um, realized that especially the, the, non, or the native and non-native um, the groups, so we are trying to engage more of our native partners, and that's one thing that SDSU Extension, um, a lot of the work that we do is in tribal communities, um, and so trying, trying to bring in um, the the schools that we work with there. We have school wellness coalitions in in um, a few of the reservations, um, and um, and then different partners. So so right now, um, kind of we're all in here too. But um, myself, and then we have Lily from Dakota Rural Action, and then Cinda is is new at the Department of Ed, um, and she's got uh, that farm to school portion um, in her role. So that's really exciting. Um, but 
but we are, um, especially Lily and I, um, with Dakota Rural Actions contacts in um, with the different tribal organizations, um, trying to, especially in that realm, get get more involved. Um, and there's a lot of great work going on for Native Farm to School, um, and so it's really inspiring to see what they've done and maybe what we can learn from from them also. But um, do recognize that it's currently not a, we're not doing awesome but um hoping that this is a good starting point to to begin to build relationships um and learn from each other because i don't know all the steps moving forward about what to do but hopefully it's, we can we can that that is currently the stuff that we're working on with the coalition is diversifying who do we know who can we invite so that we can hear everyone's opinions and expertise and stories about what farm to school has been or should be um so that we can move forward with all of those those pieces in mind um yeah but yeah i definitely lily if you would like to say anything or cinda if you'd like to introduce yourself <laughs> um go for it yeah no gabby i'd just like to add i think um that you referenced the congo cdc and their program is great i've actually got to go to a couple of their um teaching experiences um Dakota Rural Action did a canning training with some of their interns for, for that program. And in the past, we worked closely with that organization um, and have, have partners there. So I will definitely um, reach out to them about farm to school activities and on Rosebud Reservation because that is a really great organization. And several of, um, I know a couple of the, the people who are part of Sikongo CDC also are sitting on the Local Foods Coalition. They're just in the Food Sovereignty Subcommittee, typically not in the farm to school. So that is definitely a gap. And thanks for identifying that. And I will definitely reach out to them and see if we can get them involved in farm to school as well. Thank you both for that. <laughs> and come to our meetings. <laughs> Love to have you. Uh, are there any more questions? Um, I see Cinda did put a comment in there too um, about there being a preference for um, that the Farm to School grant has a chance for applicants to meet certain criteria, including organizations led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, and they do have a preference this year on rural also. Um, I do just did just realize I forgot to mention um, shortly the let's see, I don't think our member is still on here from the Department of Ag and Natural Resources, but we will be um, they are releasing farm to school mini grants uh, for and this is specifically though for um, schools that operate the National School Lunch Program. So um, I think it's up to 2000 or $5,000 each um, that they could receive to kind of build capacity or offer programming around farm to school. So um, something to keep in mind that should be releasing soon um, for the schools in your areas. Okay, then if there's no more questions in the chat box, I'm going to put in uh, an eval for the conference. If everyone could just take a few minutes and complete that, it isn't very long, but it's super beneficial to help us make sure that this conference is relevant and what uh, the attendees are needing. If you have any suggestions for next year, please put them in the comments of the eval. Um, but with that, we do still have two more meetings. So our next meeting with the SOAP South Dakota Local Foods Coalition. I'm going to put that link in the chat, although you have it as well in your program. Um, and hopefully we will see you there in about 15 minutes. So with that, thank you very much, Anna. That was great information for producers or just community supporters of local foods.